Good evening. Gas prices and whether they're ever coming down is where we start this evening. I'm Leland Vitter. We are watching a few stories tonight that will all have major impacts on your life. Obviously, live pictures right now. Kenosha, Wisconsin, we are watching developments there. The jury has retired from deliberations for the evening, although there's still some protesters out. We're going to check in on the developments inside the courthouse a little later in the show. First, America's sky-high gas prices and the continuing pain that it is causing not only at the pump, but high gas prices rise the cost of everything we buy, from food to Christmas presents to new cars. Currently, gas is up 60% this year, and the oil traders have big bets that it will go a lot higher. What does that mean for you? Well, we did a little math here. Oil today closed at $80.11 a barrel, the price of gas $3.00. And 41 cents. That's the national average. If oil goes to $150 a barrel, which is not unheard of, the price of gas translates to $6.38 a gallon. As they used to say, buckle up. President Biden told us last week that rising prices, also known as inflation, are a top priority. So let's look at things he could do to lower the gas prices. Tapping the strategic oil reserves, opening up new drilling on federal land and offshore drilling facilities for American companies. He could reverse his day one policy of shutting down the Keystone XL pipeline. Those are just a few of the things, none of which he is doing. At a speech today in Michigan, he highlighted his spending money on electric school buses and other electric vehicles. We're going to kickstart new batteries, materials, and parts production and recycling. Boosting the manufacturing of clean vehicles with new loans and new tax credits. Creating new purchase incentives for consumers to buy American-made, union-made clean vehicles. If you listen to the White House talking points and the spin, they say that building new batteries will somehow eventually lower gas prices. Stay tuned. The president has also written a letter claiming there is mountain evidence of anti-consumer behavior by oil and gas companies. There is scant evidence for such a claim and... His critics argue it is a distraction for the administration's policies that have gotten us to where we at, are at. But the president said it, so we put News Nation's Kelly Meyer on the case to fact check. She joins us now from yet another place with sky high gas prices. Hi, Kelly. Hey, Lillian. Yeah, this is a, a gas station with probably the highest prices in D.C. behind me. We're right around the corner from Capitol Hill. And as paying up the pump, as you mentioned, is translating to political problems for President Biden as he's battling these uh, dipping poll numbers, trying to address this issue. As you mentioned, he reached out to the Federal Trade Commission, asking them to investigate these oil and gas companies and finding out why the gas prices are remaining high while the gas companies' uh, prices are going down. Take a look at this. The last month of gas prices averaged $3.25 a gallon, while U.S. prices for uh, oil prices averaged $81.40 a barrel. The last time the prices reached these similar levels was October 2014. The FTC telling us today when we reached out that they are concerned and looking into this. Republicans here on Capitol Hill are placing the blame squarely with President Biden. Take a listen. Uh, gas prices are up 60 percent uh, from last year. And the fact of the matter is that um, no one's wages are growing at that rate. And as you mentioned, Leland, earlier, the president talking about uh, the social spending bill, saying that that will not add to inflation and it will, it, it will help it. Republicans say it'll be the exact opposite. Either way, these prices, uh, even if they drop a few cents here before Thanksgiving, it's still the highest number we've seen in seven years. Leland? Yeah, there's charges on the other side now of voodoo economics in terms of whether or not this is going to actually bring prices down. Kelly, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Obviously, story that is not going away, certainly in Washington. It's not just gas that will cost more this winter. Look at the price to heat an average home in America. The Energy Information Administration predicts natural gas costs up 30 percent, while the cost to heat your home with electric up 6 percent to $1,268. President Biden decided to take the issue of those soaring prices by asking the FTC to investigate oil and gas companies. He's accusing them of price gouging at the pump. The letter said, I do not accept hardworking Americans paying more for gas because of anti-competitive or otherwise potentially illegal conduct. Those are the president's words. Daniel Turner, here to respond, runs Power to the Future, a group that lobbies for rural energy customers. All right, Daniel, uh, did the 
president catch all these greedy oil executives red-handed? Yeah, about a year ago, I predicted that when the Biden administration took place, not only would we see gas prices rise, but he would also then blame the energy industry for these rises. And this is exactly what he's doing. Um, we know their playbook. Um, he is the cause of this. We produce two million barrels fewer every day than we did just a year ago. And the reason why we produce so much fewer oil is because, yes, Biden has made it harder to drill. He has fracking moratoriums. He has bans on access to federal land, et cetera. But he's also scared off investors. Why would you invest in a business that is going to be persecuted by the White House, by John Kerry, by the EPA, by the Department of Interior? And so all of these things coupled together have made gas very expensive. It didn't happen overnight. It took a few months. But, but political actions do have consequences, and these consequences have caught up to the Biden administration. He needs a scapegoat, so he's choosing the free market. Well, you talked about investors. Why would anybody invest? In fact, people are investing in oil companies. Chevron stock up 39%, Exxon stock up 70%, gas prices up 60.9%. So right there uh, in the middle, the argument would be the, the oil companies could certainly make less profit and then prices would be lower, wouldn't they? Sure, but a lot of these publicly traded companies are also much more diverse than just oil and gas. Most of them are investing in a lot of the green technologies, which are going to get huge subsidies from the Biden administration. The vast majority of oil we produce in America comes from independent, uh, non-publicly traded companies. Um, and these are the ones who are being punished the most. The big guys, the ones that you just mentioned, um, a lot of them are in solar and in wind and in diversified technologies. Hmm. And when Biden is writing multi-trillion dollar ch checks, these companies are going to profit. And I'm not here to advocate on behalf of, of the oil industry. I'm here to advocate on behalf of consumers and the American people and these jobs in rural America. These are the ones who are suffering at the hands of this administration. Well, it, it, it's always those of us who either grew up or live in rural America who, who get the uh, short stick from Washington, no matter almost who the administration is. This is Chuck Schumer, obviously Senate Majority Leader, member of the president's own party, who says, yes, there is more that can be done. Take a listen. But we can put our finger on the scale with something called the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. But it has reduced prices significantly in the past. And it also says to the monopoly that controls oil, don't mess around because we're going to counter what you do. Yeah, the Washington Post says that the president's advisors asked him to do this for months, but he has not. The question would be, do you believe the president and his inner circle, the true believers, think that high gas prices are really a problem, or is it kind of a convenient way to get people excited about electric vehicles? I, I think, look, if you want to push a green agenda, you need two things to happen. You need to denigrate the fossil fuel industry. You need to make it the enemy, and that's what they're doing. And you need to scare people that the end of the world is very near. And that's what they do with COP26 in Scotland last week. That's what they do with the climate change hysteria. So both of those things together is what is going to get Joe Biden his green agenda. Things like the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. I mean, how long has, has government talked about a lockbox, a, a, a reserve, a rainy day fund? They tap into it when they have absolutely no vision, no leadership, and they are cowards. And that's what this administration is. They are visionless. They yeah, have I'm, no I'm political enough, will. I think you and I are both old enough to remember the social security lockbox and how well that went yeah. uh good to see you daniel as always thank you thank you all right reasonable people can agree tweeting an animated video of you killing a colleague in any setting is just a bad idea full stop call it conduct unbecoming a gentleman and it is exactly what congressman paul gosar did here are some screen grabs of the video in question if you didn't know what these types of videos are popular in Asian culture, they included images of him in animated form killing Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Today, the House voted to censure Gosar, which is less than a expulsion. It's basically a statement of disapproval and requires the lawmaker to give up any committee chairs they held. By comparison, the last censure came in 2010, condemning Charles Rangel for 11 ethics violations. That vote was overwhelmingly bipartisan. 
the left has nothing else to do but troll the internet looking for ways to get offended and then try to target members and strip them of their committees. I've heard everything talked about today. Inflation, Afghanistan, schools, except the issue we're here for. America is dissolving under our feet and Democrats are worried about cartoons. No matter how much the left tries to quiet me, I will continue to speak out. You are no Alexander Hamilton. We speak, the FBI is treating parents as terrorists. This is an anime. It is Shingeki no Kyojin. Highly popular, stylized, intended to demonstrate the alienation people feel. Clearly today's thoughts were not bipartisan. That last lawmaker you heard is Congressman Andy Biggs from Arizona uh, with us uh, today. All right, Congressman, at the beginning, can we agree that tweeting the video was not gentlemanly behavior? Yes. Okay. Not gentlemanly behavior. And you are, and therefore, you're against a censure. Why? Well, if we're going to start censuring every member of Congress for, for conduct that's not gentlemanly or ladylike, then everybody will be censured in Congress. So, so that can't be your standard, uh, Leland. I mean, as we pointed out, the hypocrisy here of all kinds of conduct from the left. Uh, I mean, right now, the latest conduct by Cori Bush is basically to incite a riot in Kenosha. They tried to incite a riot with, in the Chauvin case. They tried to influence the juries in that case. You've got uh, uh, Maxine Waters actually trying to get a, a real violence going. Uh, in that case and another time. So you have all this stuff, and the reality is um, what you have here is a, a minute-long uh, anime uh, that I would never have never have produced and probably I don't really like anime. I never would have even looked at it. Good grief. It shouldn't have been done, it's pretty but bad. it was done. Huh? Yeah, it's pretty bad. Um, I yeah. guess, I guess you know, the point Democrats made, and, and we all learned in kindergarten, right, uh, you know, two rights don't make a wrong. But the point Democrats make, and it's a legitimate one, is that when you have a member of Congress advocating violence against another member of Congress, uh, even if it's an animated video, that, that is a different level, is it not? But you're saying he's, he was advocating violence. I don't I'm not think saying he, that. I'm saying that's what Democrats said, but oh, go yeah, ahead. Yes, yeah, Leland, absolutely. I think that that was the, the point they were trying to make. I disagree with it. I mean, this is such a knee-jerk reaction. So, like, when you, we, the last time we censured anybody in Congress, they went through a whole ethics investigation and ethics hearing, committee hearings, and then they brought it to the floor and everybody could digest it. That's not what happened here. This thing, this thing I guess this story broke last weekend. Um, it was up. Uh, Gosar took it down because some people said they were offended by it, so he takes it down. And next thing you know, they're basically booting him off committees and saying, you know what, there's no place for you really in Congress uh, that's le legitimate. And, and that seems to me so quick, so knee-jerk, mm -hmm. so over-the-top reactionary um, to, to and disproportionate to what we to what we well, saw. I mean, I've, I've watched the video uh, it's, now. It's probably and, fair to say that Democrats had uh, Congressman Gosar are in their sights for a while now, and this, yeah, no. this was just the this was just <laughs> the last. This was just something they could get him on. This was Steny Hoyer, uh, the House Majority Leader, today. Take a listen. This is about decency. This is about security for our members. This is about democracy, not violent overthrow or opposition. I, for one, will join you in enforcing that standard on any Democrat who violates it. Interestingly enough, there were two Republicans who also joined the Democrats, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. You had in the past called for both of them to be punished effectively by the Republican uh, leadership for their voting, uh, their votes in the past, uh, vote for the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, do you think they should be punished in some way for this vote as well? No. Okay. No, they can vote for this any way they want. The, 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 the reality is, uh, Liz Cheney, don't forget, she was the chairwoman of the Republican conference. And then I'll just say what the comments that you just presented by Steny Hoyer is just a big fat whopper because when, when um, we've brought uh, discussion and tried to have discussion about things like what Maxine Waters said, where she was advocating for for violence, whether it was in uh, uh, the the Chauvin case or against anybody who supported Trump or worked for Trump, 
They're, they're like, oh, it's mum's the word. We're not going to say a thing about it. When we talked about the anti-Semitic discussions yeah. that... With, yeah, no, that, no, the, the point with the, the, about Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and others, their comments yeah. was, uh, was right. You brought up the issues of Cory Bush. Hey, Congressman, all I have to say is that if I ever say something that people are offended by, I hope I have friends who are as passionate and loyal as you are defending me, all right? Hey, Leland, I, I, I defend people, people's right to say stuff. Um, yeah, even if you don't agree with it. It's the way... Even if I don't agree with that, it. That's, that's exactly right. That, that's, that's America. Exactly. You're, yeah. you're, you're a good friend and uh, a great, uh, great sport to come on with us. Good to see you, Congressman. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Leland. Yeah, Take care. Good to see you. The jury is still deliberating, not as we speak. They've taken a break for the night, deciding the fate of Kyle Rittenhouse. We'll tell you about the questions they had for the judge today. And a circuit court has blocked President Biden's vaccine mandate for large businesses. We'll tell you why OSHA, the Biden administration, is now all but given up on the mandate. Amid the fierce showdown over vaccine mandates, the definition of what it means to be fully vaccinated may be changing. The White House chief medical advisor, Dr. Anthony Fauci, is urging every vaccinated adult to get a COVID booster, saying the extra dose will keep people out of the hospital. The FDA currently only recommends boosters for high-risk groups, including the elderly and those with compromised immune systems. Meantime, Disney is now requiring kids five years and older to get the COVID vaccine before going on one of their cruise ships starting next year all guests ages 5 to 11 must be fully vaccinated. All guests, period, over 5. Now the kids have been approved to get the shot. They had been exempted, and all guests will also be required to show a negative COVID test prior to boarding. There's a new push on Capitol Hill to stop the Biden vaccine mandate, Biden vaccine mandate and testing mandate, using congressional powers. All 50 Senate Republicans are expected to file a formal challenge against the mandate using the Congressional Review Act, the process where lawmakers could eliminate an executive branch rule, but the move is likely to falter with Democrats obviously holding the majorities in both houses of Congress. The Biden administration says, though they will not enforce their January 4th vaccine mandate for private employers, it's an embarrassing admission of defeat on a key part of the president's COVID plan. You might remember the president announced the new rules in September. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, took months to draft them for a mandate with a testing exemption for businesses with more than 100 employees. Back then, we predicted a legal nightmare for the administration. That nightmare is now coming true. And OSHA says they're going to pause enforcement because a federal court of appeals found serious issues with the rule. Chris Hahn hosts the Aggressive Progressive podcast, served as an advisor to Senate Majority Leaguer Chuck Schumer. Uh, all right, Chris, good to see you. Uh, who's the, nice who to do, see you, man. Who do we blame for this? And how, how is this not an admission by OSHA and the administration of an overreach? Look, I think it's going to work itself out. I think these mandates where they're happening in the states are working in New York. Uh, you know, there was a mandate on cops and 90 percent of cops got uh, vaccinated. And we're starting to see cases come down here in New York, especially hospitalizations. So uh, I think, look, we're trying to get through this crisis. We're trying to end COVID-19 so the country can move forward. The president is trying to do things. It would be a lot easier to end this crisis if we were all rowing in the same direction and encouraging people to get vaccinated instead it's become a partisan issue. So if I'm going to blame anybody well, for, frankly, well, hold for on. this, Quick. I'm going to blame people who are who are like people like Tucker Carlson who are going on the all air right. and telling people this is all a big conspiracy. Well, on the I other got hand, vaccinated. The only thing President Trump, President that, Trump's told people to get vaccinated. So there is that he got vaccinated. It's interesting. I want to get your perspective from sort of the legal side and the governance side. One of the things that the court cited when they put a pause on the mandate was this tweet. Um, it was retweeted by Ron Klain, who's the White House chief of staff. OSHA doing this vax mandate is an emergency workplace safety rule is the ultimate workaround for the federal government to require vaccinations. And then Ron Klain, the White House chief of staff, uh, tweeted that just from a comms perspective. That's pretty embarrassing, isn't it? Well, look, it is a workaround to get this vaccine mandate. Okay, and it enough. is what it is. Yeah, so, said, I mean, he's being said, honest. Yeah, yeah, you know, said, they're, they're trying... Go, yeah, you said we, the quiet part out loud, vaccinated. right? Yeah. Well, well, yeah, look, we got to get people vaccinated. We got to do whatever it takes to get people vaccinated. We've got to convince people to get vaccinated. And frankly, everybody needs to be rowing in the same direction. I, what I hate most are these people who jumped over little old ladies to get vaccinated, 
who are now telling people it's all a big government conspiracy, and you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I think I do, and I'm not going to mention their names, but there you go. A I guy would... who used to have me on his show all the time who will never have me on his show again, and I don't really care. Well, we're, a we're, their theorist. loss, their <laughs> loss is our gain, and we're glad exactly. to have you. I wanted to get your thought uh, about what we were talking to Andy Biggs about. Uh, Congressman Gosar now censured for tweeting out this animated video that sort of had him and Alexandria Cortez at war, and then he kills An Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We'll put the pictures up. Uh, Andy Biggs, yeah. among a lot of other Republicans, said he should not be uh, censured. You say he absolutely yeah. shouldn't be censured because there should be much worse penalties. Yeah. You know what? There's only been 24 censures because most people resign in yeah. disgrace over things like that. Leaders bring them to the woodshed of their own party and say, you're out of here, buddy. Here's your resignation letter. The reason why Kevin McCarthy will never be Speaker of the House, and I'll bet you a round of golf anywhere in the country on this, okay? The reason why he will never be Speaker of the House is because he is not a leader. He is not, he does not command respect from his members. Instead, he is a follower, and that kind of person never rises to the top when the ultimate time comes. This guy should have been told, you are out of here. You, this yeah. is beyond breaking well, the quorum within the house. Right. You're, you're right that there is no more taking to the woodshed by leadership. Um, no bet, but uh, it's a fascinating thought and one worth uh, continuing to look at. It's good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Nice yeah. to see you, too. Awesome conversation. We are still awaiting a verdict from the Rittenhouse trial, but did the jurors see everything they needed to? There is a key video that the defense claims was withheld. We'll show it to you next. Today in court, the defense asked for a mistrial in the Kyle Rittenhouse case because the prosecution withheld evidence, specifically a high-quality copy of video introduced late in the trial. The judge still hasn't ruled on that. Rittenhouse claims self-defense in the killing of two, shooting of one last summer during BLM and Antifa riots. Some of the same crew was out today, the scuffles you saw earlier. Robert Schalk and Julie Rendelman will tell us if Rittenhouse should get a new trial and if the defense should really want that. Quentin James, a nationally known activist for the black community, he's standing by as well. We start with Brian Enton, live in Kenosha, Wisconsin tonight, where things are pretty quiet now. Hi, Brian. Yeah, hey, Leland. You know, you see those close-ups of the protesters out here outside the courthouse, and it looks like a big crowd. But to be honest, it hasn't really been a massive crowd. Today, there were more people than any other day, uh, and there was really just about 50 to 100 protesters uh, at the max outside the courthouse. And for the most part, people uh, were peaceful out there. A few scuffles here and there, uh, but people were peaceful. What was really interesting is when we went about a mile from here to the business district that was virtually destroyed uh, during the riot last year. There is still so much damage there uh, from what happened uh, over, over the summer last year. Uh, people are still rebuilding. People are nervous there. Even people who support the protesters are basically begging uh, for nothing like that to happen again, saying they just cannot afford to go through that again. They can't lose their businesses again. Uh, we talked to one business owner a couple of hours ago. Listen to what she told us. My hope is that everybody, if they're going to protest, which they are right now, is if they can just be peaceful, don't burn the town, don't wreck businesses. You know, some people can't afford. I, if, I, if my business is gone, I have six kids. <laughs> I have a newborn baby. I can't, you know, I wouldn't be able to take care of my children. So you heard her there. That is basically what other people told us in that area, too. They are on edge right now, hoping that things stay peaceful. Leland? Yeah, understandable. You could, you could feel, really, the emotion uh, in her voice. Brian, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. Quentin James, the founder and president of Collective PAC, which seeks to elect more black candidates to office, joins us now. Quentin, we appreciate you being with us. Good to see you. Uh, is this really a trial that should be protested on the basis of race or the Black Lives Matter and Antifa movement? 
Well, listen, I don't think it's about Kyle Rittenhouse's race in the terms of, you know, he killed a black person and, you know, it's kind of similar to what we've been seeing. I think this is a question around uh, does justice apply uh, to everyone in this country? Uh, many people are really upset that this, you know, young person who at the time was 17 years old, um, you know, he had a weapon in which he was not legally allowed to, uh, you know, have uh, traveled to this place um, under the guise of, you know, uh, you know, trying to protect property, uh, which is the job of the police, something that he's not trained to do. Um, and three people ended up, you know, dead. And so I think that the challenge here is, uh, does our law hold him accountable uh, for his actions? Well, it, um, you know, I, I think he will, you know, probably be acquitted, right? But, but I think the, the issue, though, is, um, is that right? And well, right, but kind of struggling we, with we, that as, as we kind of watch yeah, this Yeah, the unfold. question is, is it right, though? But that, that's to be judged by a jury. Aren't we to believe that the justice system in America works? I, mean, I don't know what more you could ask for in terms of how he was treated. He was arrested immediately. Within 24 hours, he was tried and convicted on television. Within 48 hours, he was charged. He was called a white supremacist by members of Congress and the president of the United States. How do you argue that he got special treatment? No, no, no. So uh, again, I think the justice system played, it, it, you know, its part there. Um, but does the law that we currently have on the books, um, is, you know, is it going to hold this what people are calling a vigilante accountable? Uh, d does our law really uh, take into account what what happened here? Well, I, 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 I let think me, that's going to be the this. challenge. I just if, if the jury decides this. that he is not guilty. Well, let me just clarify this: Is your issue with the self-defense law of the state of Wisconsin, which every legal expert I have talked to says almost certainly exonerates Kyle Rittenhouse, or is your issue that the law is being applied unfairly to Kyle Rittenhouse? No, it is that the the law is not caught up to a situation okay. where a 17-year-old can cross state lines, possess a weapon that he should not be able to legally have, and to use it to kill people um, when they're using their, you know, constitutional right to protest. I well, think that or, is the, or, the, the, or, the, the situation yeah, yeah. here. Because, again, or, that, that well, night, police, police did not hold, hold kill on, anyone, quit, right? The facts matter. Or when they're pointing a gun at him, or when they're beating him with a skateboard, or when they're doing other things. So, But your point about whether or not the the law needs to be changed is a different one, and one I know that you all, uh, you all work on. We appreciate the time. It was a good conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good, good chatting. All right, today's drama in the Kenosha courtroom centered around key pieces of video that were withheld from the defense. Prosecutors blamed everybody but Mickey Mouse for the mix-up, which could cost them the case, or at the very least, give Kyle Rittenhouse grounds for appeal. Take a listen to the debate. The file I received originally on Friday the 5th was not labeled that same and was not the same file amount. That was the one that went to the crime lab. And I will testify that an officer of the court, I take offense that what I'm saying is untrue. There's no way that what ADA Krause is saying is true because the file name would not have changed. So to now claim that, that they are somehow prejudiced is preposterous. You know what, we can't resolve this now because this is gonna require expert testimony. Wow. Joining us now to discuss today's courtroom drama, defense attorney, former prosecutor Robert Schalk, criminal defense attorney Julie Rendleman. Appreciate you both being here. Boy, Robert, it just seems like every day the prosecution gets caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Yeah, and as a former prosecutor, I can tell you there's nothing worse than when a judge calls into question your, you know, integrity. And that's what's happened here. And this is now the third time. On cross-examination of Kyle Rittenhouse twice, they tried to get into the fact that he executed his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, which is a no-no across the board. Uh, they tried to get into uh, cross-examination of a motion in limine that had been ruled in favor of the defense. It was almost as if they were trying for a mistrial because they didn't like the way the case is going. And now, after summations are over, a videotape in the possession of the government is found to have a higher resolution and a different file name. I mean, this Brady versus Maryland says that the prosecution must turn over all evidence favorable to the defendant and they cannot play fast and loose with it. And that's exactly what's happening here. If he's not yeah. acquitted and he is convicted, this case is ripe for appeal. Yeah, it, it certainly seems that way. And obviously the defense is arguing that they've already asked for a mistrial without prejudice. They asked for a mistrial with prejudice. Hey, Julie, you know, it's interesting. It, it one side, the prosecution argues, hey, we're experts at enhancing video, therefore on rebuttal, you should look at this grainy piece of video that we have enhanced and it's all perfect and this is what it shows. And then they say they're so stupid that they can't seem to transfer video from an iPhone without degrading the quality of it, which is it? 
Uh, I don't know. I don't know which it is. I, I, I will say, look, there's there's several arguments. Their argument is that when it was transferred, that it automatically compressed onto the person's phone, onto the defense attorney's phone. Their position is that that, that is absolutely not what happened. I mean, the long and the short of it is the, the defense's position is we did not see this clear video prior to us going forward with our case, and therefore we're prejudiced because we would have approached things differently had we seen it and known what to argue. And so, it, 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 look, it, it's not in a vacuum. Um, your other guest made it very clear this is not the first time the prosecutor has been called out. I'm open-minded to see what, it, what information we'll learn as to what they really did turn over. But once again, if there's a conviction, this is just another pile-on on a potential appeal. In your time, Julie, have you ever seen a judge speak that way over and over and over again to a prosecutor? Um, I, every day that I was a prosecutor, I got spoken to much worse uh, than that uh, <laughs> okay. than, this, than this judge ever does. Um, I'll, I'll say two things. Much of what the judge does is not in the presence of the jury. Um, he definitely tends to express his ire when they're not there. There are times, however, when he has expressed his ire when they are there. And, and I'll be honest, if you do something wrong as a prosecutor or as a defense attorney, you should expect to get yeah. called out by the judge. You've got to behave yourself. You've got to follow ethics. You've got to follow the rules. And if you don't, the judge is going to call you out because the jury needs to hear and know the right information, the, the ethical information. And so, look, I've, I've seen it much worse. I think it's yeah. mild compared to what, what has happened to me. Well, um, at, least, at least that is an honest admission. Um, Robert, Julie, great, great conversation. Thank you both. We appreciate it. Uh, president you. Biden's going to meet with the Mexican president tomorrow. Will Mexico finally cooperate on the border? President Biden's going to take a break from his infrastructure victory tour tomorrow to deal with something that's been crippling his poll numbers, the southern border. Take a look at the polling right now. Just under 42 percent of Americans approve of what the president is doing with his job. 52 percent plus disapprove. His numbers on how he's handling the border are far worse than that. The president will meet with the Mexican and Canadian presidents to discuss a slew of issues, including the recent surge of migrants, but unfortunately, the president has little to no leverage at the moment with the Mexican president. Here's Mr. Biden, Secretary of Homeland Security, yesterday explaining that Mexico just isn't playing ball. It is because uh, we are implementing the court's order in good faith. We are working with Mexico. It requires a bilateral re relationship and an agreement. All right. There's already thousands of migrants headed to the border through Mexico right now. Another caravan scheduled to start tomorrow. And that's not all. Axios reports Mr. Biden's new border problem. Nations won't take back migrants. An unprecedented number of migrant adults are coming from countries that make deportation difficult, primarily Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Brazil. Simply put, countries are not taking back migrants, and they're coming from countries that don't make deportation easy. A man charged with protecting the border, Brandon Judd, president of the National Border Patrol Council, uh, joins us now. Uh, always appreciate you being with us. If you listen to Secretary Mayorkas, hey, it's not the Biden administration's fault. It, just blame this all on Mexico. Does he have a point? No, he doesn't. In, in fact, if they would have never gotten rid of the MPP in the first place, we wouldn't be in this current situation. There's an awful uh, lot I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt do. you. I don't know what NPP means. Uh, the Migrant Protection Protocols will remain in Mexico. If, if they wouldn't have gotten rid of that program in the first place, that they're supposed to re-implement, um, that Mexico has given the, this administration a hard time doing, if they wouldn't have gotten rid of it in the first place, we wouldn't be here right now. There's an awful lot that Mexico can do to help this issue, and they did it under the Trump administration, but they have to have reason to do it. They're, these cartels are generating billions of dollars for the Mexican economy, and if, this, if, if President Biden doesn't step up, and if he doesn't do the same thing that President Trump did, such as uh, threaten tariffs against them, then there's no reason for Mexico to help us, even though there is a great deal that they could do. They, there just has to be an incentive for them to, to actually step to the plate. Yeah, you, you look at the numbers, migrants by year, 2019 under the Trump administration, 921,000. 2020 during COVID dropped to 547,000. That was the combination of 
get tough from the Trump administration and COVID. And then it spiked now almost to 1.7 million. That is so far in 2021. That number um, will go up. Is the Biden administration using Mexico as a foil almost to saying, hey, look, it's, it's not our problem and therefore they don't have to make any of the hard decisions or take any of the tough political choices? Well, that's the spin that this administration tries to do all the time. When they're caught as being wrong, then they'll try to deflect and try to blame other people. They continue to try to say that this is Trump's fault. They continue to try to say that he got rid of all of the infrastructure when in reality he built up the infrastructure. And so this is the deflection game that we've, we've been expecting from this administration. But again, all we have to do is look at history. What has Mexico done in the past? And any time that this country has been tough on Mexico, any time that we have tried to force force Mexico with such things as tariffs or withholding um, uh, money or economic uh, issues, we've seen Mexico step to the plate. And, and again, there is a lot that they can do. These people that are coming through Mexico to be smuggled into the United States, they are violating Mexican law. They're not just violating the laws of the United States. They're also violating laws in Mexico. So there is an awful lot that they can do. The question is, will they do it? Yeah, you don't sound optimistic uh, in, in that statement, but we appreciate you leaving it as an open question. We'll see tomorrow how the conversations go. This headline caught our eye, and it's important to, say, to realize. Texas Democrat, this is Henry Cuellar, conservative Democrat. We've, we've had him on the show, a fine gentleman, certainly a Democrat in every sense of the word, uh, but a practical one from Texas. Uh, calls for new borders are, I've moved on from the vice president. Does who the border czar is really matter, or is it more what the policies that the border czar are implementing? Well, it, it matters in what the border czar is telling the administration. If the border czar goes to the administration and says, this is what you must do, and then the administration doesn't do it, then it's going to fall on the head of the administration. But if you have a border czar that is weak, if you have a border czar that is looking to pander to open border um, special interest groups, then the administration isn't going to be getting the information that is necessary. You always have to have, in an in, in administration, you have to have people that are going to be willing to push back on what your general tendencies are. If not, you're never going to get the proper information and you're not going to be able to make uh, the informed decisions because of that information. So yes, it is important who the border czar is because that person has to give good information to the administration. I believe that's what Doris Kearns Goodwin called team of rivals for President Lincoln. Uh, Brandon, good conversation as always. We appreciate you taking some time on a uh, Wednesday evening. Talk to you soon, my friend. It was good to speak with you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Meghan Markle joins Ellen DeGeneres for her first talk show appearance since leaving the royal family. If you're confused, so are we. We thought Meghan wanted privacy and wanted to give it to her. Nothing says privacy like doing the Ellen show. She's given two interviews this month already, which is more than most celebrities. One magazine recently suggested she will run for president and her work advocating for paid parental leave is just the beginning of Megan the politician. In times like this, we bring in veteran editorial director who's covered thousands of national stories for The Daily Caller, Vince Colonnese. All right, is there something about Megan that the press just can't walk away from? <laughs> Celebrity. I, I just think that they're kind of attracted to it and they're like, okay, let's, let's cover this. And they give her all the attention that she craves. I, maybe not enough, actually. I mean, she clearly craves a lot of attention. This is the, the duchess of drama. She, she got everything she wants. She married the prince and then she wrecked the royal family, came back to the United States and has decided, well, she hasn't had enough. I mean, I love how they're making a big deal out of the fact that this is her first talk show in some time, but that's a very narrow category to be said, well, it's my first talk show. Yeah, but what about the the interview you did with Oprah hours long at like some $20 million mansion in California uh, and sort of the nonstop public exposure that she's had since coming back to the United States? This isn't a woman that's trying to avoid scrutiny and attention. This is a woman who dives headlong into it whenever yeah. she gets the opportunity. And she she has no discernible skills that I'm aware of, actually, other than doing interviews. Uh, but boy, they give them a lot to her. Yeah, well, and really bad acting if... Uh <laughs> you, you, if you're into that kind of thing. But anyway, um, it's interesting. The other thing she's dived, dove into a little bit is politics here, and, and legitimately so. I mean, she's calling, cold calling U.S. senators on their cell phones, yes. advocating for paid parental leave. It, however, uh, is not exactly working. Uh, it'll all come down to Senator Joe Manchin, whether paid leave is in the Build Back Better plan. This is what he had to say. Take a listen. 
Paid family leave. Okay. The Democrats in the House are putting it back in the bill. Yeah. Does that change your view on it at all? John, I don't think it belongs in the bill. If she pushes hard on this and it fails, does that in any way hurt her political currency? It wouldn't be the first thing that she wrecked. I, I you know, here's the thing about like, I'm a, what I'm interested in here is how she's ending up with the private phone numbers of oh, all we know, these senators. We know, that. we know that. Kirsten Gillibrand gave them to her. Oh, did she? Okay, yeah. so that there you go. So, so there you go. This is a service Leland provides, the, the news here. Okay, so she's got these numbers. She's cold calling United States senators. She calls Susan Collins of Maine, and she said, we need made family leave. And good for Susan Collins. She was like, well, that's fine. It's nice that she called me. I'm much more interested in what my constituents have to say about all of this, though. Yeah, no, it was, and, it was well played by her and Shelley Moore Capito. This, though, you, you get a sense that in some way, the Democratic Party really misses the celebrity of Obama, of yeah. having this sort of star quality politician. They thought they had it in Kamala Harris, clearly doesn't exist. Joe Biden's not that either. Is there some attempt, as the American Spectator article put out, to create this sort of aura around Megan the politician? I, I, I think so. I mean, certainly for Megan, you know, you referenced it earlier that in Vanity Fair of last year, in last year, reported that a friend, a close friend of hers suggested that she's very eager to run for president potentially in 2024, which would explain some of the political moves she's trying to make here by calling senators. But this whole like cult of celebrity thing, I, I think at one point celebrity endorsements and celebrity involvement did shift people. But I, I think if Democrats are relying on that, they're missing on what missing out on what's going on in the country, which is that a lot of people are starting to reject the ruling class sort of writ large. That includes Hollywood, the media, the politicians. So it doesn't actually drive more people in their direction when they bring out a Jay-Z or a Beyonce or yeah. even somebody much lower down like a Meghan Markle. Uh, it actually makes them think like, I don't live your life. I don't have a $100 million uh, deal with Netflix. I don't have a $25 million deal with Spotify. I don't have a $20 million book deal. I don't live in a $14 million yeah. mansion. You don't actually have anything to do with my life and you're not gonna convince me to, to do anything. Yeah, no, that you make a great point in, in terms of how we're now seeing this shift uh, in sort of elitism uh, as it relates to the Democratic Party and a shift away from the Republican Party. Chris Christie next with Dan Abrams. Thanks, Vince. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.